Hi guys, welcome to the show. My name is Seb Ostrovich, aka the voice of the people, and this is the Weightlifting House Podcast. Okay, I'm just bringing us in and Sam, I'm not going to Why did you laugh. say that? Because like, I saw you smiling. Don't laugh. I'm smiling. I'm a happy guy. All right. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Weightlifting House podcast with your host. What? <laughs> this is two weeks in a row now, Josh. You have to get a grip. You have to pull yourself together. Um, with your host, Seb Ostrovich, the voice of the people, joined, of course, by the people scientist, Joshua Gibson. He's nodding his head in agreement. <laughs> He's ready for the show. He's doing his best to not start laughing. Um, but just for interest of full disclosure, the 30 seconds before we hit record, Josh was basically unable to communicate. <laughs> he was so deep in hysterics. Um, it's become a bit of a Pavlov's dog. When we when we get ready to record the podcast, he starts dying of laughter. Um, some level of self-sabotage, perhaps. Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. <laughs> that's a very measured response um we've got a lot of good topics to get into today the well we i'll probably do a quick overview of, of all of them um we want to talk about flexible programming so what that means at least to josh and i is um is it, a, basically training without a program mm. kind of like a limitless training program it's actually in many ways what james moser did slash does um, you turn up to the gym and you do the training that you think you need to do. And so we want to talk about that uh, kind of conceptually and also with a few key points as actually if you did want to do that, how would you do it? What are the things to keep in mind? Um, and how could you actually turn that into being something quite useful? We also wanted to talk about, and again, this is kind of to do with some of the stuff that Josh has been thinking of recently, uh, going along with the whole Mike to share style training. Um, is in, instead of having all of your sets going up to max, something like Travis Ma Mash might do, you know, five RMs here, uh, three plus one RMs here, snatch pull plus snatch plus overhead squat, rep max, uh, actually having rep minimums, mm -hmm. having these complexes that you have to do straight weight across to ensure that you're getting in the right amount of volume needed to, to adapt and improve, uh, whilst then kind of allowing people to have the, the range above those sets to to push if they if they feel like they're able to on that training day. Um, we wanted to talk about we've got a couple of questions off Patreon. One of them was what would you do if if you're not able to train so frequently um, and for only a short amount of time are you still able to increase muscle mass? That's an interesting one because obviously this guy um, is stuck and is in that situation wants to know uh, are his efforts going to be worthwhile. Uh, talking about the Thailand drug busts, all of that kind of stuff, and uh, Josh, as he does so strangely during the week, has thoughts and then writes them down on his phone, and they make no difference. So we spent a few minutes trying to decode some of Josh's writings. One, what was it, Josh? The nuances of training and experience? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, mean, I don't... <laughs> I, I said, as long as Josh knows what that means... Then, uh, then we can talk about it. But I, I can't say I understand at all what that means. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think the the topic that is going to be the most enjoyable to talk about, the one that I'm kind of excited to put my opinions forward, and then also maybe, or almost certainly, and hopefully develop them and learn a little bit more and really consider this as a real viable option, would be the flexible programming. Mm. So how do you go day by day, waking up in the morning and deciding what you're going to do that day? Or, or even going to the gym and deciding almost exercise by exercise, rep by rep, what am I going to do? Um, and there are limits to it, but in many ways, it's also limitless. So, Josh, do you want to kick us off with, at the very least, why you're thinking about this and maybe some of your thoughts as to how you go about implementing this into a training program or as a training program? Yeah, I'd like to do that, but I do want to say that I bought a pair of mm. shoes on eBay. Is this why... Is this the big news that you wanted to talk about? This is the big news. <laughs> <laughs> I put a bid up. Uh, I, was okay. the, I was the only bidder. Um, oh, that reminds me. Did I win my shoes? Can, oh, God, can we just focus you on talk. me for a second, Seth? <laughs> okay, you have okay. five minutes for the intro and everything else. It's finally my turn. Did you turn. get the 08s? 
I got the 2000 Power Perfect. Ooh. Uh, red and white. So those are going to be very awesome. nice. It'll be very nice to wear. Very nice. <clears throat> I actually bid on a pair of those. I'm uh, were, I'm unsure whether or not I actually got them. Were but... they the blue and white pair? Um, let me see. See this this the thing that I do, which is like a real issue of mine. Um, actually, I, I bid on so many pairs, I can't quite remember what it was. So no, I I've, I've bid on the the Ironwork threes. Mm. That's what I've bid on. Wait, are those um, the um the gray with the wooden heel, like no. the black strap? Oh. Uh, no, they're not. They're, they're white. Okay. They look like the 08s. Yeah. They look exactly like the 08s, but they don't have the little gap between the mm. heel and the and the ball of the foot. Um, can oh, we I just know what you're talking about. Yeah. Very quickly preface this by saying that Josh and I spent a good half an hour trawling through eBay on the last episode of The Morning Brew, which is just up on Patreon. Uh, Josh was freaking out because he thought that we were going to bore everyone. It turned out it was like the most popular section of <laughs> The Morning Brew of all time, and well, people were loving the shoe talk. Two people said they um, loved it. Um, yeah. So don't oversell it. Well, dude, I've got... I've got seven hours left on these pair of shoes. There yeah. have been two bids. Both of them have been me because I outbluffed myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put a bid and then I and then I got freaked out that someone's going to do more, so I I went up again. Um, dude, I'm sat on fifty five pounds. Really? That's like seventy dollars. What size? UK thirteen. That's a big shoe, but I've got big feet. Mm. Uh, that's like. Thirteen and a half, oh, maybe USA. Massive, That's dude. I've got way big feet. You don't have feet that big. Trust me, I'm wearing a pair of twelve and a halves right now, and they're pretty snug. Yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling like that. They're pretty snug. Were th- um, those uh, those American weightlifting shoes you got from Glenn? Weren't those or you wore for Glenn? Weren't those thirteens? They seem to fit I pretty think they well. Were. Yeah, they, I told you. I'm telling you, they fit well. Um, now I'm 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 dangerously teetering on the edge of just scrolling through eBay and looking at new shoes. So I'm Don't I'm going to exit it. this tab and move on. You do not do uh, that. So so you bought a few uh, you bought a pair of shoes. That's good. Yeah, and it's, I, been, it's been about time. I yeah I don't know how much you typically bid um, mm-hmm. from the like how much you raise it from the starting price, but I bid one dollar more than the starting price, and I got it. Wow. Yeah. That's good, man. I mean that's what I should have done, but I've I've ended up, you know, calling my own bluff and bidding more and more <laughs> well, my, <laughs> on my, my own thing. My question is, I bid. I'll, I'll go ahead right. and say the price. I bid two hundred and one dollars, and I won, Oof. and then it went down to two hundred dollars, which was the original price. So if right. if no one else bids, does it just go down to? The I think so. Price? Oh really? Yeah, which means that if no one bids, then I think it's going to drop down to forty five pounds. So like wow. less than sixty dollars. Um. Can you tell me what the shoes were again? I just want to make sure I've got the right ones in my mind. Yeah, they're Adidas Power Perfect. Um, <clears throat> the red and white. Ones? Yeah, they're the ones, yeah. And I can I'm even... Just, just looking, just to make sure I know. Um, I have... Is that them? Maybe. Do you mean these? If, if you're watching the YouTube, you can see. No, not those are the twos, man. Those are the power. Li- oh yeah, because I was gonna say because those are like the starter pack. On <laughs> the <laughs> those cal- are the weightlifting starter pack. Those are the, maybe the worst shoes in weightlifting history. They were the Cal Strength starter pack for a while. I think Scott Hisaka, Nicole Lim, uh, well, Shaheen. I had them. Yeah, man. Well, well okay. <laughs> well, I need to find these because you- I, I want to make sure that you've made a good choice because I know what you're like. Wow. Um. Oh, okay. This is this is them. So. I'm going to show you this picture, but this it, it, these are the blues, the blue and white. It's those, right? But it's in red. Yeah, those are it. Ah, uh, those are such nice shoes. You know, Michael's yeah, I, actually bidding on those blue, blue pair. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah, I've bid on a, I've bid on a few pairs of those. I, I prefer it in the red as well. Yeah, you've made a, you've made a great choice there. Thank you. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Yeah, you're gonna to have to post that up on Instagram at some point. I'll, uh, I'll take a picture with the shoes on. And I'll be in the the bottom of a squat, and I'll have a weightlifting mm-hmm. house T-shirt on. It'll nice. be an epic photo. It will. That's something that I, I would love to be able to do at some point, but I just don't know how. I don't know how to go about it. Would be to deal weightlifting shoes. Yeah, that'd be. <laughs> but like, you know, yeah. you'd have to have a contact of someone in Russia who's got access to hundreds of pairs of 08s and 04s and stuff. Yeah. The 02s, and then, and then be able to to deal them properly. But that would be cool. 
that would be a lot of fun. Um, can we talk about? Can we get into topic now, Josh? Or are you gonna you're gonna hold us back with some more no, shoe talk? No, I was gonna talk about. Uh, someone what actually this? brought this up again. It was the Scott Hisaka situation Jail. that happened recently. I never mentioned yeah. it. I don't think you never mentioned it. That's what I was thinking. I don't thinking. think I, I don't think I brought it up. I just did. It's not weightlifting. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's a strange situation, and it's it's a it's. Even though some people think there's only one opinion to be had, it's still remarkably a polarizing topic. Yeah. One that I don't even know if it's worth getting into. You know, like. Yeah. I mean, what if you want? What did you want to say? I just think it's incredibly nuanced too. Like. Yeah. There's there's obviously the the immediate reaction of. Right. Person A, and then there's the yeah. immediate reaction of Person B. One right. person that likely knows him, and one person that likely doesn't. I'm yep. sure it meets in the middle somewhere. Yep. Um, it's it's more of a discussion for um, ethics than it is. Yeah, you're right. Weightlifting. We'll we'll save it for the morning, bro. Let's do it. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do that. Speaking of which, just very quickly before we get into the show, uh, we do have a 45 minute video yeah. of uh, Safanov, the one of the national Russian coaches, um, interviewing questions with him up on the Patreon account. Uh, we also have. Who's the dietitian? I've just completely blanked oh, on the name. Greg Ferris. Yeah. Greg Ferris. We've also got an interview with him uh, and a bunch of kind of cool stuff going up on there. Obviously, we had week one of the weightlifting news show in video is up. We don't know if we're going to continue with it. We're kind of getting feedback from people right now, but um, there are some there are some cool things up there if you want to learn a little bit more from the from the Russian senior coach. Yeah, and before we dig into the questions, can I just read off a couple of the timestamps for the Safinov video? Uh, so people get an idea of the questions he answered. Oh sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so, because I think it's it's awesome. It's right, right. Do your athletes ever question your methods? And um, I think that's an interesting question because he's employed by the government. Right. His athletes are selected um, and then put through the system. Uh, so it's not necessary. There's no choice exercise there. It's really like you're right. going to do this, and then they end up doing it. Um, right. That's kind of an answer Safanov came back to frequently was uh, people were asking him random questions. I can't remember exactly, but he was just saying like he had no choice. He had to weight lift. Like he mm -hmm. had no other option. Um, so he doesn't ne like he didn't necessarily love it. It was just something mm -hmm. he, he was kind of forced to do. Um, right. So thinking about how his athletes uh, act in a situation or environment like that is really fascinating mm -hmm. to me. We mm -hmm. also touched on bar etiquette. Right. People get so yeah. upset about uh, the Russians being very deliberate about you not stepping over the bar and, and respecting it. Um, I don't get what the problem with that is. It, it's if you want to be respectful to the bar, like I get, like like we are all drowned in tradition in many ways. Yeah. And as like Americans have traditions, not I don't know about weightlifting traditions, but they have traditions that the rest of the world thinks are just ridiculous. Yeah. But it's okay to have them. So why there's a problem with the Russians having the tradition of you don't disrespect a bar by stepping over it. I don't like we have traditions in the UK, like bizarre ones to do with drinking tea and eating scones, like <laughs> just stuff that the rest of the world would think, why do you have that? What's the point? But we have it. So I, I mean, treat a bar as respect if you want to. Uh, and if you don't want to, don't, don't, don't talk shit to people who do. Like, well, what's the point? And it's a unique setting, I think, where they're at, where you have... Right these these athletes that are competing for uh, russia in a gym training incredibly hard devoting their lives to the sport mm -hmm. and it's not it's not so much a um social experience where people no. go to the gym to hang out and, and chat no. and bullshit the barbell is relax. providing them with the barbell is providing them with a better life with a paycheck yeah yeah so they have to have respect for it in many ways yeah exactly um yeah that's no, that's great. Uh, we yeah. also touched on uh, how, if Russian programming was influenced by Ivan, Ivan Abajev, I thought that was mm -hmm. an interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, actually, Ivan Abajev was influenced by Russian programming. What do you if, mean? By if that? you listen to, if you, well, Ivan Abajev started off as an athlete. He won the first medal for Bulgaria uh, in 1956. This is my weightlifting historian knowledge coming out. Oh. Why do you say that? Because I, I read your post. Did I say 57? Yeah. Huh. Maybe it was 57. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> um, 
and then he became a strength coach and eventually a weightlifting coach started off just running russian program basically mm. you know it was all soviet union stuff so just running um uh oh no it wasn't soviet union what we're talking about but anyway they were just running soviet training kind of stuff um and then that that gradually turned into kind of pushing it to its max where it was tons of variation a ridiculous amount of volume mm. much lower average intensity and then he kind of went you know full 180 dropped exercise variation down exercise selection down intensity mm -hmm. up volume down um and it kind of grew from there but yeah i think he was heavily influenced based on how he trained and how he coached initially by the the soviet union so it's kind of like what we're getting into today where we're talking about going from uh, a, a macro focused plan mm -hmm. with months and months of training detailed to an individual day being up in the air based on the athlete's needs right like literally regressing from the, the utmost planned point to okay here's a, here's a guideline here's a template we have it in our minds mm -hmm. but we're not actually going to put it to paper until we we analyze the situation mm -hmm. um Okay, and, j and just kind of touching on a couple of the last few questions, he actually told a really interesting story. Someone was asking if he ever kicked an athlete off the team. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he doesn't speak English, so he's, he's speaking Russian, and the translator is, is right. translating it. Uh, and he was talking about, uh, he was in the gym one day, and he starts sniffing, and then he looks <laughs> over around the corner, and he sees an athlete smoking marijuana. And then he just, really? he just motions. In the gym? Yeah, in the gym. And he just like motions <laughs> him kicking him out. Uh, it was hilarious. <laughs> it was so awesome. That's funny. Uh, we talk about ever using split squats or unilateral exercises, and he just goes mm -hmm. on this rant about um, Olympic champions and high-level weightlifters making all of these YouTube videos and making up these special exercises for the views and, and, and the money. And and it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all bullshit. And yeah. the Russian program is, while it's complex, maybe in its exercise selection, it's very simple in its execution. Mm. Um, and then, I mean, just stuff like that. We talked about deloading and, and bodybuilding. How do you become mm. a, a coach in Russia? And I don't want to get too much more into that, but as you can tell, those are, those are prime questions. Like they're not, Yeah, I mean, it's actually, it's the fact that you went and did that and that they actually allowed you to film because I remember when the Russians first started touring, uh, Klokov, I mean, Klokov, Ilya and Polovnikov did a three way tour. <laughs> wow. um and and no one was allowed to you can even take photos uh, of a lot of it uh, so the fact that safanov who's a coach so in many ways more interesting than those guys and in, in some way more knowledgeable at least of the sport i'd have thought uh that you were just allowed to go in and film the whole thing i think is amazing it's, it offers us a pretty unique look into the the sought after russian training system which is pretty cool and I don't think you guys get how nervous I was when I, I set up the camera. I have my camera on the tripod. It's it's yes. focused on him and the, the translator and the gym host. And for some reason, I, I I had everyone in the back of my mind. I had all of you guys in the back of my mind as I'm sitting there. And I, <laughs> I bring up a question about steroids. And I have this camera pointing directly at him. And I'm essentially interrogating him. So what's yeah. it like, you know, uh, I heard this, uh, I heard this story about guys using drugs at training camps. Like, can you, can you, uh, validate that? And I'm just like, why the fuck did I ask that? <laughs> I was so nervous. Why did you ask that? What did he say? I can't remember. Well, he, I, I guess, and, and this is kind of, uh, this did is he just dance around it. Kind of. He was just saying that, you know, steroids aren't legal in the U S um, so if he were to tell me that he uses them, like I could go to the police and, and report him and, or that if, think he if, could. if he had steroids, I could, huh? A anyways, he was just saying like, it's probably yeah, not yeah. best that he brings it up, but that in and right. of itself is an answer. Yeah, I suppose. Maybe, yeah, maybe it that it's not that, that open or that talked about or, um, right. you, you've read, uh, is it white prisoner? With, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. So I read an excerpt on uh, All Things Gym, and yeah, he was yeah, talking yeah. about good amount on that. Yeah. Ivan coming up to him and and being like, "Hey, hey, <laughs> here's some new drugs. Like, take these." Right. So and I didn't know if it was. Yeah, they refused. They um, refused. Yeah. I just didn't know if it was as open as that. Like, yeah. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, did you see Pielashenko was posting? <laughs> did you see? Yeah. On his story, he was posting yeah. a stack. 
Like, <laughs> was trying and to then sell it, it went up on Reddit, and and it was it didn't turn out to be anything much. But then he did it again, and I think this next time it was actually something anabolic. This mm. is like, I mean, you're you're already a popped athlete. Like, <laughs> how, how are you gonna do this? But yeah, no, it's just a, it's a different culture, man. It's a different culture. It yeah. is. All right, so let's let's talk about this flexible programming. Um, you brought it up, so let's kick us off. Yeah, I've been playing around with it. So obviously, the longer you're in the sport, the more you develop, I hesitate to call it a system, but the more you develop specific ways of operating um, and, and programming for certain athletes or certain skill mm-hmm. levels or certain technical deficiencies. Um, so you already kind of have, you, you can intuit a, a little better, right? Mm-hmm. You see an athlete and you think this exercise would go really well. Um, and sometimes a, a program, a, a mesocycle, a, a four to six week block of training can almost limit athlete development if, if you aren't flexible enough in that if you program in an exercise and it's it's uh, actively worsening their technique, you can, I mean, you can't just adhere to that for another six weeks and say, fuck it, we'll, like, we'll, we'll readjust uh, mm-hmm. because you're wasting their time and you're wasting your time. So I was I was thinking about maybe having a little more flexibility in the day to day training and being able to mm-hmm. select exercises based on how the athlete looks, mm-hmm. feels, mm-hmm. acts. Right? If they're excited right. to train, maybe we just say, "Hey, let's let's do some full snatching or let's do some full clean and jerking." Um, well, this will be the heavy day in the week. If they feel like trash, let's do some exercise that's more technique oriented, uh, lighter. We'll do a little more accessory work, kind of a little more fluff. Mm. And if they feel strong, but they're just not super, super motivated, maybe just have the strength work on that day that you kind of push. Mm. And and we mentioned this when we were chatting about it, but the squats, the pulls, all of that stuff mm. would be r- relatively cemented in its own day within the week. There wouldn't be much right. variation there because those ha- have to be uh, a, a little more... Uh, a little more focused with their progression. It can't just be a like more structured. Oh, you want to squat today? Let's max out. Well, I think it's interesting that we draw that distinction because I think we can answer the question both ways. Because, I mean, if we, if you look at what Glenn used to do with Cal Strength, and you hear the stories from all the athletes, and Glenn has confirmed this, it very much was they turn up, they start warming up with the bar. By the time they're at the hundred kilos, they're like, "Hey, Glenn, what are we doing today?" Mm. And Glenn says, "Yeah, we're working up to a hang hang snatch max for a double." And so they just keep working up, and, and it's very, it is kind of this intuitive programming. Um, oh, my dog is barking outside. Many apologies if that got picked up on the microphone. Um, <laughs> damn it, Maya, she needs to calm down. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was very intuitive, but of course there was still this this certain level of structure. Like on Tuesdays we squat, on Thursdays we front squat, and on Saturdays we squat again. Um, I imagine to some extent things like pulls, not that they really did them, or, or push press at least were built into that. And there was some some level of structure, just knowing Glenn. But I think it's a really interesting concept to talk about not having that. Because, and, and, and it's a very difficult thing to do because if, if you come in with the idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I feel I need to do on any given day, there are a few things that you need to, you need to have really the, the first is a lot of knowledge about who you are as an athlete and what actually needs to be done because you know i have friends who if if they come in and just do what they want they will do just that and they'll just do what they want to do rather than what they need to do so being aware that you have certain weaknesses or certain strengths that you need to focus on is important and then i think where it gets hard is it's almost like the moment you say okay i'm gonna do a little bit less on this today so that tomorrow i can go heavier the moment you've done that is the moment that you've essentially then created some level of training, yeah. or some level of a program, some level of structure. The moment you back off on a Thursday so you can go heavier on the Friday because you want to, you know, do really well, or, or or you're lifting and you think, you know, I'm not feeling so well today and I really want to go heavy in two days, so I'm going to leave it there. You, you've already looked so far into the future that this whole idea, this whole concept of planning day to day is already over. So it's a very difficult thing to really truly do that and and i think in many ways you do need some level of structure um even if it's just that you know you go a little bit heavier on a friday 
so you know you're going to go lighter on a Thursday. And other than that, you kind of go by feel. But, I mean, you can almost do it. If you treat every day as, I'm going to come in, I know what I need to work on. I know that I am uh, a jump forward in the snatch, so I'm going to do some no con- no foot snatches. And I, um, I pull the bar too high in the clean, so I'm going to do some high block cleans. Mm. I... I'm going to do some pulls today and then the next day coming, I'm going to do some squats. And then you pick two exercises at the end of every training session for three sets of 10 on each that are there to target the muscles that are lagging. And and you just have to be smart enough to know what those muscles are. But I think these two ideas of no programming, one with structure, one without are, are radically different in many ways. Yeah, it is very challenging and it really, it really pushes you out of your comfort zone because mm-hmm. In, in many ways, having a program is kind of this uh, safety net. You can always fall back on it and say like, hey, but in two weeks we'll be strong. Or right. don't worry about today because we'll, we'll have another chance to go heavy later. Or you, you can always fall back on something that's set and, 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 and I don't want to say rigid, but already um, thought out and, and really mm-hmm. almost put the locus of control on that, right? You're removing your right. control as a coach and, and putting it in the program. Whereas day to day, that's exactly what it is. It's it's taking a lot of it's taking a hard look at yourself and saying, what do I need, not what do mm. I want. Mm. Um, which is, I, I guess you can't really draw a hard line through those questions because you you should want what you need, especially mm. for the day, um, and how you feel is <clears> going <throat> to influence what you want. Right? You're really mm-hmm. beat up. Like a lot of people think, you know, fuck how you feel, train through the pain, uh, mm-hmm. go until your eyes bleed, let's kill it, brother. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case, right? Uh, there's something right. to be said about training and feeling relatively good. Now, are there certain situations where you can kind of brush that off? Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, a little story about uh, sat, uh, Friday when I was squatting. I, I told mm-hmm. you I wanted to bring this up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just finished jerks from the box, did my five doubles, um, went up for this an is exercise. the end of This is the end of week two on the weightlifting house program that's exactly what it is yeah and yeah. We, we had jerks from the blocks i did five doubles went up right uh, went up to my 90 percent missed a set made it oh. and then uh right. I, I got ready for squats and i was just walking around and i'm like my lower back hurts like my lower back right. it feels uncomfortable mm. both erectors i just didn't feel right and i'm like right. man, i really and it, it was a big set of squats for me uh it's yeah. one of those things that i really planned out like I, I really right. need to hit this, and I, I mean plan- you've been saying you've been saying since the start of the program the numbers that you want to hit, and that's on exactly the, on the final is. week of of squats, which are not there. We're not on the final week of the mezzo, really. Uh, we've got a couple of weeks left, but you, you're you're certainly approaching it at this point. Yeah, that's exactly what it was, and and it's not that. That's the really difficult thing about goal setting, um, mm-hmm. is you start to artif- you start to really try and fit yourself into. Uh, Mm -hmm. this space that sometimes isn't that's this is a really weird analogy i'm not going to follow through Uh, Um, oh go on you try and wedge yourself into this position that just isn't isn't possible right yeah triangle Um, into a square shaped peg or something yeah or triangle peg into a square hole yeah 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 exactly thank you i I really need that's right uh but you need to be like putty malleable be like water be like water my friend yeah Um, water crashes and falls and flows yeah (laughs) Ooh, um, <laughs> a bit of Bruce Lee on the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyways, I was just thinking about putting water into a barrel and how it takes the shape of the barrel. Um, <laughs> but no. So I was I was getting ready for squats and I think okay I need this one sixty like if I if I have a chance right. at one sixty five which is a big PR next week. Yeah. I need this sixty and I need right. it more. Need it I need it more than anything to feel good. Right, yeah. because I don't, I don't want it to be a grinder set. I don't want myself to nearly die doing it. To think next week, I have to best that. Uh, right. So I'm I'm getting ready. My back hurts, right? My, and my also worth mentioning, fucked. like you're not, I mean, you're you're going. I mean, this is beltless. This is sorry, it's not beltless. This is without sleeves. Without sleeves or wraps, yeah. Or wraps, all that kind of stuff. So this is you know, pre- pretty raw. Yeah, you know, you've got the belt on, but you know. I think it's raw because when I hit 160 for 10, it was with wraps. So right. 60 for eight without is like a decent set. Um, yeah. It, people could always debate you on how much the wraps give. I think it does right. help a lot more so with yeah. positioning. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's a different topic for a different show. So my back was hurting. 
and mm. my buddy's there and I'm like, dude, my back really hurts. And I don't know what I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this. Like, mm. I don't feel good. I, I'm, I'm really nervous. I'm, I'm, I'm really scared to be honest. You're bitching out. I'm petrified. Yeah. Uh, and I'm telling him and I suddenly have this realization. I'm like, Ryan, that's his name. Mm. He yanks the bar off the floor. He doesn't create any tension, uh, in his first pull. I just have to mention that. So hopefully he changes it. And I'm like, Ryan, dude, like, I don't feel good. And then I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I haven't even touched the fucking bar yet. And I'm mm. already convincing myself that I can't do it. Like how fucked right. up is that? Right. Like how, how disappointing is that? That your first thought before you even take an air squat mm. is mm. I can't do it. I'm hurt. Right. That's, that's some, that's some weird shit. It's not a good place to be. That is not no. a good place to be. And I know mean, that, that is, that is the, the, the cave that this whole structured programming does ultimately put you in because you know what's coming in three weeks in advance. Yeah. <clears throat> and that is something that you do, I suppose, mitigate to some extent with the, this flexible programming idea yeah. that we're, we're mulling over. So anyway, go on. So, so what happened? Did you, did you snap out of it? Did you go home? Did you, did you cry? What, what went on? So a little bit of everything. <laughs> a little <laughs> no. bit of crying. Uh, so I, got, I, got, I took the bar and uh, it yeah. didn't feel bad. I took 70, didn't feel bad. The thing I've really had to grow to learn or grow to understand and, and, and really embrace is mm. that the weight always feels heavy on your back. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. 140 feels like a ton of bricks. Yeah. 120 feels like a ton of bricks. Right. It's annoying. It is annoying. But the difference yeah. is you almost condition yourself. It feels heavy, then it feels light. Like I've, I've, I've learned to kind of uh, pair those two mm -hmm. feelings together because it feels heavy when I unrack it and walk it out. And then it feels light as soon as I come out of the bottom. Like I, I right. just fucking blast it out of the bottom. Yeah. So take 70, uh, take 100. I think I took 20, 40, 55. 55 was my last warm up. It Wait, felt... 20, 40, 55. Okay, yeah. yeah. And it felt yeah. okay. I mean, it didn't feel, it felt decent. 20 for what, set of three, four? Yeah, I think I took 100 for like three to five. I took maybe 20 for three, 40 for one. Uh, one or two, 55. 50, 55 for one. And yeah. I like taking singles that are close to my max weight for the day. Yeah, yeah, I think there's, yeah. there's, a, there's something to be said about preparing the nervous system, um, mm -hmm. potentiating it, so to speak. Right. Uh, and you can even do this with the actual weight itself. I could have taken 60, squatted it, racked it, waited like 30 seconds to a minute and then taken it for a set. And, yeah. um, you know, I'd really be primed in that sense, but right. took 55 put 60 on the bar, put some music on, put my headphones in. This is a, this is a moment I live for when I lift. What, what, what are you listening to? I want to know. I want, I want to set the scene. You don't want to know? Tell me. You wouldn't even know. I mean... Is it some, some weird... Heard, it's some, it's, it's uh, like, kind of right. like, you know, I don't want to say emo because it's not that. But it, it's yeah, okay. Yeah. So Maddie Rogers listens to... Something a little bit aggressive. It's something Maddie Rogers would listen to. Like... I don't know what she listens to. I thought she listened to dubstep stuff. She listens to like like screamo music. Like, oh really? Like rock that's got All very right. good vocals and anyway. So I listened to some Matty Rogers music. Oh right. know. So we're pretty much okay. the same person now. So yeah. Well, she probably lifts as much as you right now. But yeah. All right, that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so I put sixty on the bar and I uh, I took it. I made it. Right. And the yeah. last rep was a grinder. The moral of the story here is that fuck how you feel to an extent. At least... I feel like the moral of the story is <laughs> everything that you don't tend to preach. <laughs> exactly. But I did it, right? It's like you just got to the conclusion of the story and then you suddenly thought, oh no, <laughs> I'm, about to, I'm about to conclude against what I tend to preach. I mean, to an extent, right? Like, right. I think a lot of that can be chalked up to knowing what you have to do and then trying to find a way out of it. It's yeah. different if you just like rock up to the gym and God, what did, why did i say that uh it's difficult if you kind of like roll up to the gym and why can't you say rock up to the gym it just sounds ridiculous no, it doesn't rock up yeah i rock I, up. I feel like like that's like all right go all on. right anyways um spin over to the gym <laughs> whack up to the gym <laughs> no you're using whack wrong i'm gonna have to teach you that properly yeah all right go uh, on I think it's a thing where you just kind of, you, you try and tease that out beforehand. Mm. You, can, you can't, I mean, you can't wait to the last second. Mm -hmm. And you have to have someone there maybe watching 
um, to give you some feedback. We, we always talk about like a co- that coach-athlete relationship, mm-hmm. and I, th- I think that's incredibly important in just injecting reality into these, the situation mm-hmm. and saying, like, they look good. They, they visibly look good. So whatever you're feeling is either in direct opposition to what's happening or right. you're, you're actually injured, and I'm going to err on the side of the former. Uh, mm-hmm. Stick with it. Let's go. Let's push today. Mm-hmm see what happens and, and that's what i tell people mm-hmm. i coach is just put the weight on the bar see what happens <clears throat> mm-hmm. give yourself a chance to make the weight um mm. don't tap out early because you're nervous because right. everyone's right. nervous right. before a big set of squats I don't, I don't care who you are yeah i am i am because it's i mean it's hard it's fucking hard it's a, it's like the hardest thing you do yeah. i don't get scared the day before i max out my snatch necessarily i'm kind of excited yeah uh, but the day before, I have to set a new five rep max. That's kind of scary, mm. because you know it's gonna, it's gonna take more, more of a pain tolerance. Mm. You have to kind of be a bit braver in some ways. It's a different thing, but you do kind of it. It just it sucks more. It hurts more. Well, um, and there's there's also there's that balance between being in the moment, but also mm-hmm. being um a little checked out of the moment and yeah. in, in the sense that you're not consciously thinking about what what is my left pinky toe doing what is right. you know my right knee doing uh yeah. how am i setting my back but you're bracing properly uh yeah. you're, you're maintaining tension in the right tempo and that's where practice comes in that's where practice comes in you know yeah. no autonomy it, it's got to be autonomous the unracking the way you grab the bar it's got to be the same so that you don't have to invest mentally in the process of what you're doing mm. you can and it means the same with you know uh, heavy cleaner jerks it's nice if you don't have to think about the technique because you've done it so many times and you do it right that you can actually just focus on being fast or being aggressive and the movement's going to be there yeah it's kind of that same concept um i mean i i have so many stories about squats <laughs> it's just uh I, I mean like i have this weird relationship with squats where i I love them, but I suck at them. Yeah. Like I just suck. I'm just so bad at squatting. Uh, I do have done. Like, do you think that's actually something that is because of of, of you and, and your build and, and your strengths and weaknesses, or just because you haven't found what really works? I feel like I haven't found what really works. Yeah. I mean, like I've squatted. You know, I've done 150 for 10, 65 for five. Like I've done, it's not like I can't squat anything. Um, I can squat over 400 pounds, but like I just, I suck at squats. Mm. Just suck. I, 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 I feel like you're right. I haven't quite found exactly what it is. And the funny thing about it is there are certain squat programs that I look at and I, I look at them and I go, yeah, that's, that would, that's not for me. Yeah. And I look at others and they click and I go, yeah, I know. I just feel it in me that that is the sort of thing that would get me going, which is, one of the reasons I'm so disappointed that I'm not doing the squats that you're doing right now. Yeah. Because I look at those and I go, that's the thing. Like, that's the thing right there that I feel would be making a big difference for me. And I'm looking forward to being able to jump on and get onto that. But, you know, right now, I, I, I can't. I, I don't know if I told you, one of the things that the my physio is having me do is when I next go to see him in four weeks, I have to be able to do three sets of 10 pistols on each leg. Ooh. Dude, I can't do one. I'm not joking. Yeah. I've been I could do them in the past. I had a go. He was like, give it a go. I can't. Yeah. Like I could barely even sit in the bottom without falling over backwards. But the like having the strength to stand up with one leg <laughs> it's just crazy to me. Yeah. But um no, I, I I'm so aware that squats in many ways are the key that unlocks my potential. That I'm obsessed with them, I'm obsessive with them, I love watching them, I love writing squat programs and reading squat programs and they're the thing that they're my you know you know when you look and you examine a squat program sorry you examine a weightlifting program for yourself the thing that i am drawn to immediately is i just i look at the frequency average intensity and and general progression of the squats and if that isn't there and it isn't right for me it doesn't matter what's going to happen it doesn't matter how many snatches or what the intensity of the snatches or what the variations are there is nothing magical about the rest of the program that will get me better if the squats aren't right. Yeah. I think that's yeah. that's really good to know. And I can kind of relate in saying that. 
when I look at a program, I, I'm very much a guy that likes a lot of variety. Uh, mm -hmm. So if it doesn't have a lot of that or it's not varying, mm -hmm. you know, every few weeks, like it, mm -hmm. it can easily get bored with it. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's, it's important to understand your own limitations. And I guess mm -hmm. that that note I had in my phone goes right in line with this. It's mm -hmm. understanding the nuances of training and experience. Um, so I know that I need a certain amount of variety. You know that you mm. need a certain structure of squatting, of squats, or squatting right, right. structure. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you just are going to bang your head against the wall. Uh, <laughs> these are things that d develop with time. It's it's like we talked about with the 165 that I'm going to hit next week. I know how to prepare myself to do that. That's mm -hmm. a skill. That takes yeah. time. It takes experience. Yeah. There's a yeah. nuance there that people don't get. And I and guess that's that, where that like, that that argues against the flexible programming to some extent because you don't have the time to prepare for the 165 for eight but you do because the squats are more structured the strength work so you, is more structured oh you're, you're keeping that as structured. okay, okay I, yeah. I think it would have to be i i'm not unless you were doing a, a squat every time you came into the gym that's a different mm -hmm. story because i've done that uh right. when i was maxing every day every other day yeah. every every day besides like sunday right i would just say what do i want to pr how do i feel uh, yeah. I don't feel great. I'll do a beltless PR. Uh, I feel yeah. really good. I'll go for a single with a belt. I feel all right. I'll do a paused. P like I'll was go this? For a did you PR. run the um the squat every day that Travis Mash put out? Is that what this is? I just made or it like up. the Corey Gregory type of thing. No, you no just I, made just, it up. I just made it up. I'd front squat with mm -hmm. with a belt, without a belt, with a pause. I'd back squat with a belt, without a belt, with a pause, and I would just like yeah. rotate it based on how I felt yeah. and try yeah, to yeah. try to PR something. Like the pause. I did that for a while. Yeah, and it works really well. And I guess it that's... It worked amazingly, yeah. You know, you kind of build this um, mountain of evidence. And uh -huh. that's what drives you to explore these approaches like flexible programming. Mm -hmm. um, I think it takes two. I think it takes two people. I don't know if I could do it for myself. Uh, mm -hmm. There'd be a lot of doubt probably riddled in there. I don't mm -hmm. know if you would agree with that. Yeah, there but, is, yeah. Because um, I do have another aspect of this I want to chat about. But doing it yourself. Like I come in, what do I need to do? Um, let's do something within the 70 to 80% range. Uh, mm -hmm. Just pick an exercise. To me, like I, I want to see a progression though. And I'm sure you, you're the same way when you're looking at a program, you want to see that there's there's something at the end of the, the four weeks or three weeks that makes sense. Instead of just like randomly appearing and, and hitting a PR and thinking, okay, that was luck or that was chance. It wasn't it wasn't intelligent programming or intelligent design uh, to adopt a, a religious right. uh, terminology there. Right, so, right. No, I'm looking, the, the reason I muted my microphone there was I wanted to see if I could find the James Moser interview that I did because he spoke about... Where's that interview you at? Know, oh, it was a written one. Is it on what website? Wayliftinghouse.com. Oh, okay. So for anyone we, listening, if you want to check out the interview with James Mosier, we, you can also you, to, you can also pick up a hoodie or a t-shirt. <laughs> are you trying to plug me? Okay. I was. Yeah. Oh, I get it. I thought you actually didn't know. Wow. Um, All right. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it whilst we're doing this, but any, anyway, um, let me go back to my Skype so I can see. There we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean. Can you can you repeat the, the the final thing you just said to me? Yeah, I think just talking about it, talking about in, incorporating this mm, mm. as a single person rather than as yeah. a du as a tandem or a duo, uh, yeah. trying to find the right combination of exercises and and, and mm -hmm. kind of uh, loading parameters throughout the week, mm -hmm. day by day, is very challenging. It's Be just an experiment, isn't it? This training yeah. career that we have. Yeah trying to work out like the, the thing you said to me is you, do you think you're a bad squatter or do you think you've not quite found mm. exactly what it is that works and it's the latter and it's there are there are so many things that you can try and so many things to manipulate that oh. changes your training so subtly that can throw you off or even if the squatting program is perfect but you just have a few too many pulls yeah a few too many hip extensions you know for me i know that too much volume at too high an intensity just buries me into the ground. Like if I'm at 85% or more a lot in the squats, I'm just dead.
um, whereas there are other people who who handle that well. Um, what are you doing with your? Oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> Muting your microphone to blow your nose. Very nice. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, if if I can get in a, a big, a large amount of volume at 75%, maybe even up to 80%, that's where I begin to actually feel really strong. And I think part of that essentially is I've got long legs, so relatively under muscled. You know, one of the things I found so fascinating when we spoke to Andy Galpin, you know, the about the differences between me and Ilya is not so much the, the muscle fiber type. It's a lot to do with insertions uh, and limb lengths, obviously, that kind of thing. But I mean, if, if you have an insertion that is, um, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the way to describe it. If your muscle insertion is, is further away than someone else's, you need a much greater amount of force. Yeah to extend that joint or I suppose to flex that joint as well if you're talking about the bicep or the hamstring or uh, or, or anything really but um, so if, if you are generally under muscle you know in a certain area to, to combat that to get to where other people are just by the luck of the genetics draw you kind of need to just spend more time building up the muscle mass required so for me I think that's what it is I think you know, I think probably my insertions in my in my lower lower body maybe aren't great, though they're beneficial for a lot of things. You know, I can power a lot, um, but I think for me, you know, when I look at a program and I see five sets of seven at seventy percent, I feel good about it. Like that to me is like I'm gonna get strong on this cycle. Uh, I'm gonna feel good. I'm not gonna be beaten up into the ground. But if I see eighty five percent or eighty eight percent for four sets of four. Mm. Like I'm running away because I I won't be able to train for a week. Like it just ruins me, completely ruins me. Yeah, that's an interesting point, and I think that's why it pays to be thoughtful about your training. It pays to mm. notice trends, um, mm. to understand how you respond to different types of training, so that you can mm. kind of go back to the well when something works well. Uh, <laughs> that sounded really yeah. ridiculous, yeah, yeah. but uh, I, I, th I think the really challenging thing. I have two points here. One is mm. the hard lines between doing what you need to do for the day and and, mm -hmm. and progressively overloading, or or thinking that you need to progressively overload one particular exercise. I think that's mm -hmm. a challenge, right? If you do a pause snatch, you just inherently feel the need to pause snatch next week. Right, because you have to progress it. You have to do the same movement right. to get better at the same movement. Right. My 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 curiosity lies in wondering whether there's a difference, you know, a training difference, uh, um, mm. a res a difference in the result if you do a pause snatch at the knee and then a pause snatch off the floor. Can we rotate those? Do you think we can mm. do that? Uh, what if we load them differently? What if we mm. mix it up? What if we do a pause mid thigh? Mm. Um, what if we do a hang, I mean, hang snatch? Like, I mean, if you look at, if you look at uh, Louis Simmons with the conjugate method, I mean, he's, you know, it's not necessarily directly transferable to weightlifting, but it's done amazingly well, and a lot of strength coaches and a lot of NFL teams employ the Westside Barbell method for their for their athletes. You know, this whole three week pendulum wave, 75, 80, 85 percent bands, overspeed eccentrics, all that sort of stuff, um, and he doesn't progress a variation from week to week to week on the max effort days, which is essentially what we're talking about with the, the pause snatch to max. You want to do the same exercise again next week. He just moves on, just says goodbye to it and gets another one. And then four months down the line, a year down the line, it's the exact same variation again, and you max it and you beat it every time. And so I wonder, I know, I know what you're trying to say is, is there a, an outcome difference yeah. between doing this one exercise four weeks in a row to progress and then moving to the next one and you have four exercises so it's 16 weeks in total or just doing those exercises in a random order for 16 weeks pushing to max is there going to be a difference between those two outcomes and that's where we need a huge sample pool really yeah. um and i mean these are these are the studies that like make me feel these are the things that make me feel alive in many ways like i want to know that i'm, I'm fascinated by that yeah. And ultimately, that's something that I'd like to be able to do as a coach is to have enough good athletes and be certain about their commitment to the sport that we can kind of run these types of experiments.
And maybe we do it. Maybe if we have enough people on the Weightlifting mm -hmm. House program one day, which obviously we don't have now, and that's fine. And it takes time for these things to grow to, you know, get the um, the reviews that you need for these sorts of things. But if we had a lot of people, there could be two separate studies run, mm. two separate programs, the same average intensity, the same strength progression, but the the heavier sets in the snatch and clean and jerk, the variations are different on each program. Mm. We could try it. One is structured, one isn't. I wonder. Yeah, that would, that'd be really interesting. And, and because I, if I, sorry, just to jump in one more last thing, because yeah. I almost think that the the random rotation could almost be better in the sense that when you're doing the pauses, unless you drop the length of the pause week to week to week, if you actually want to improve on it every single week, to some extent, you have to leave a bit in the tank mm. week one or week two. You, you can't just push to, max, to complete max every time. But if you knew you weren't going to redo that variation for another five or six weeks, you, you could push it to max every time. And just that very slight extra 2 to 3% effort that you're going to put in uh, by doing that, perhaps over time will build up to be the thing that pushes you and that program further ahead than the more structured one. Yeah, I, the, there are a lot of good questions there. Um, I, uh, again, kind of going back to that Safanov interview or uh, mm. Q&A, I mean, that's one thing he spoke at, spoke about at length was the fact that they don't repeat exercises. Right. They, they have a structured plan for squats, presses. Um, I think that's really it. Like they do back extension. Sometimes they'll hold, do, do isometrics. Sometimes they'll do mm -hmm. reps. Um, and they really vary everything. And they never right. come back to something unless it's like, eh, we did this like a few weeks ago. Let's try it again and see if we can PR it. Uh, they just mm -hmm. randomly rotate exercises. And it's from the hang, from the blocks, with a pause. And then one day a week, maybe they'll do the full lift and it'll be heavy. Yeah. And it really is just like, what can you do for the day? And they have 70% for a double, 75% for a double, 80% for two doubles. Um, yeah. And that's just to get some volume in. It's it's not really to, to to say like I'm intentionally going to max out. It's just like okay, mm -hmm. here's 16 reps. Let's get 16 reps. The next day, let's get 14 reps. If you feel good, go up. Um, yeah. The problem is, I think, unless you're in your situation where you can see the strength work carrying over, it's going to be hard to know if you're progressing if you never mm -hmm. repeat the same exercise. Mm -hmm. You have to assume that. I, I don't it's it's difficult like maybe the average weight lifted is increasing something like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. because if you pause at the knee and you snatch 90 you pause off the floor and you snatch 85 and you pause mid thigh and you snatch 83 that doesn't tell you anything if your max is mm -hmm. 105 like that tells you absolutely mm -hmm. nothing you'd have to come back to those and see an increase to say okay i'm getting better um or at least at these movements mm -hmm. and that's kind of where exercise selection comes in and I think we have two camps we have the James Mosier camp and then maybe like the Safanov camp one is mm. very specific snatch clean and jerk to max uh close 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 variations and then one mm -hmm. is like we're doing something completely different every day and yeah. like completely different and I'm not sure where you'd want to fall I would mm -hmm. guess in the long run you'd want to fall on the side of non-specific and in the short term, you want to fall on the side of specific, but that obviously depends on your squats. Um, you know how you're able to manage mm -hmm. fatigue. Uh, it depends on a lot of things, but how comfortable you are just pushing the same thing over and over again mentally. Yeah. And, and how you good know? your technique is. Can you push the yeah. same thing over and over again? And, because and, I did what we're talking about. This picking a new exercise to max out on every Friday. I I ran that for about sixteen weeks. And had a great time of it. I like, yeah. really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I would do, on Wednesday, I would do the power variation of whatever it was, whether it was a deficit or a pause or uh, from the hip or whatever it might be, all of these different variations. On the Wednesday, I went for the power. I had Thursday off and I came on the Friday and I had to beat it by, you know, 10 kilos minimum in the full version of the lift. And, and I mean, that was a good time. Like, and I, I did really well off it and I, I had great fun. And it, this was back when I was really trying to learn a little bit more about, I guess, West Side to some extent, trying to work out what they did. And I wanted to, I was just interested. I was coming back from uh, bad ankle pain. I had to take like a couple months off, basically. Um, and so I wanted to see if I could do it. And, and it was fun. And then, and then I met Glenn. 
and then everything changed. But but for the 16 weeks building up to meeting Glenn for the first time, that's what I did. Hmm. You know, constantly do you, rotating. Do you think there are certain personality types that, th I guess, mm -hmm. this kind of dictates what you would do in training? Yeah. Uh, so I would I would I would have thought. I would have thought that more extroverted people would want to change up their exercise every time and more introverted people would be happy to just repeat the snatch and the clean and jerk more often. I think extroverted people want to want to PR as many things as possible. I mean, I, this is probably a sweeping generalization and there's a, there is a spectrum of intra and extroversion, but I would have thought that, you know, people who like things always happening, like to be loud and like to be social, want to kind of do the more, I don't want to say exciting thing, because I think that does a disservice to introverted people, but to some extent, the more extroverted type of training is just to max loads of different things all the time, constantly be, uh, you know, stimulated by these different variations. And then someone who's able to just switch their mind, stay kind of in their own mind, and just approach the gym on a day to day basis and do the same thing over and over again. I, I think it, I think I might be to some extent mixing extroversion with immediate gratification as well. Yeah, which I don't know if there is any correlation there it probably isn't. But I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mixing the two a little bit in what I'm saying. But there's definitely a difference in personality type. And I probably would put it to do with to some extent inter and extroversion. Yeah. And then I, I just if we're going off the big five, there's openness, mm -hmm. right? So right. I think like openness to, to new experience. Mm -hmm. experiences i think that would probably yeah. lend itself well to a flexible program yeah. where you like doing new things you enjoy right. going out of your way to experience yeah. new cultures new music mm -hmm. new new anything mm -hmm. really um mm -hmm. because every day is different uh, so you're always right. doing something a little new uh, yeah what else is on the big five is neuroticism? it like industrious and neuroticism and industrious agreeableness oh agreeableness yeah. yeah so i think neuroticism you, you know it's funny because if, if you were neurotic or I, I don't even know what that like if, I think you would want to do the same as. thing you, you would I think, think you'd that. want to do the same thing but, but you ought not do yeah because your expectations would become so high you'd become right. so neurotic about doing better and better and better exactly you'd want them to do more variation yeah which yeah. is interesting uh you yeah. almost yeah, go yeah. against what the the personality would kind of lead you to believe mm. uh, that's kind of where I feel like I fall is is you know, you come in with well, because this it's a negative trait. Yeah. Well, to some extent, neuroticism is a negative trait. Do you think? I mean, if you take anything to its extreme, it's negative. But I think you have to have yeah, a, a little bit of everything to get uh -huh. the right amount of something. Hmm. I, yeah. But um. And then agreeableness. Yeah, agreeableness was the last one. Yeah. I don't know how that would. I, I can't see how that could be affected. I mean, as long as you're bought in, I guess, and you, you're kind of like, your coach kind of tells you what's going on, and, and, and you're like... I mean, you're going to agree to anything. Higher and agreeableness, and you're open to anyway. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just do anything. <laughs> so I guess yeah. what, what we've kind of come down to is, with flexible programming, is there's kind of a, a few different approaches. Um, I, I remember Mike Tashir was talking about something similar, and he used like a rifle versus a shotgun analogy. I think that's kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at the shotgun approach, which is every day a different variation. And then we're looking at the, the rifle approach where you have a scope and it's very precise um, and you do the same thing or you have a really structured program. Very, 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 very precise. Um, mm. And it's probably always somewhere in the middle, you know, for mm -hmm. the most part. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Glenn wrote that West Side for Weightlifting book and mm -hmm. he changed the variation every two weeks. So I think, yeah. I think Monday and Friday were the same, but Wednesday had always changed the second week. Wednesday was the, the Wednesday was always the power variation. Yeah. Well, it, it could be anything, though. I think what he did is Monday he would have a movement, and then Wednesday he would do the power variation or, or something different. No, Ma Monday, was always a, Monday was a pendulum wave of EMOMs. Yeah. 70, 75, 80, 85%. And then, Snatch. Clean and jerk. And then, okay, it was Friday's max out that was then the different yeah, when, variation. Wednesday was a max of you know hip power. Yeah. And then Friday was hip full. And those would change every two every third week. Every two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is interesting. I, I kind of like mm -hmm. that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and he would also back squat and front squat on the same day. Yeah, he would do that. And and I remember mm-hmm. with time to... intervals. Yeah, and, yeah. and rest uh, intervals. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I always wonder. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> wish I could get these answers out of Glenn, but I always wonder why he's gone away from what he's been doing. Uh, yeah. Because like when he was at MDUSA. I, I always wanted to try and get a very detailed answer to why he did what he did and how he did it. Mm. Um, couldn't seem to find that, but no. And I think in many ways that is why I think you and he are quite different coaches. I mean, for starters, he's successful. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. That do would that. hurt a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you've got some great athletes, actually. Um, but but I think he is very willing. If someone says to him what are you doing today and why he goes i don't know and i'm not sure yet (laughs) you know and that's his answer um and he is much more on this i think he is intuitively a flexible programming type of person uh and then you look at the the other side of it which is probably someone a bit more like sean waxman i'd have thought who will know what they're doing today and why do you do you agree well you tilted your head as though you don't agree i would normally agree with that but i feel like the more i've started learning about high level coaches and, and we can mm. talk to max about this um oh yeah we have max on next week by the way guys and we could talk to him about this but i remember i listened to a podcast where he was discussing uh planning training planning did i say max or sean because i thought you, i said sean. well you said sean but I, i'm trying to build a oh, okay, comparison okay. there because i think they're similar right and max said he's gone away from the more rigid structuring mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. started becoming a little more flexible and and mm-hmm. i think we're seeing this shift and it, it always boils down to the situation um mm. if they're there in person versus remote versus experience you know whatever it is but it, it is a lot more flexible on the day and mm. I'm, I'm i'm wondering if sean is the same it's like here's your problem we shouldn't waste time running the rest of the plan if this is your issue Let's change mm. the movement for the day. And I feel like inherently there's a lot of that. Uh, people just don't right. talk about it because they're selling templates. They're selling mm-hmm. pre-written programs. Mm-hmm. And when you discuss it with them, it's always theoretical. Mm. Ideally, we would do this. Mm-hmm. These are what the textbooks say or uh, the sports scientists say or the, the very experienced coaches. But in mm-hmm. practice, I just found repeatedly mm. it's it's different. Right. Yeah, I wonder if it's this this natural progression that as athletes slash coaches you go through where you start off and it, it's it's very passionate, it's very much kind of do what you want and go heavy and all that sort of thing. And then you do a bit of research, you learn a little bit more and you start thinking that your values and abilities as a coach or an athlete are based on how scientific you can be by which or so that you can write something so far in advance because you're taking into account all variables and you and and if you're able to do that you can prove that you're a good coach you can prove that you're a good athlete because you know in nine weeks on a wednesday i have 73 percent for five sets of three Mm. you know like that and and then and then you do that for a while and you you start to see the flaws because it turns out you're wrong and actually you wanted to do 85 percent for four doubles and you you realize you couldn't you couldn't predict so far in advance and there were other variables that you could never take into account. And so you start moving back towards where you started, but never so far kind of halfway where it becomes a lot more intuitive. It becomes a lot, a lot more like what Glenn and Chris LaRue said to us on that first podcast that I did with them. Um, which actually I don't think you were on were you? but you, you had them on your own, I think. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it was about how programming is an art, not a science. And there's there's a, certainly a mixture of the two. You have to know the science. Mm. You have to know it, but you have to be artistic and intuitive enough to to change it. Like, not to stray too far, but Picasso could paint picture perfect, mm. but he didn't. He was artistic and intuitive and 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 changed it to what he thought it should be, which actually it was. It, it didn't look anything like a person. So, you know, if I drew something that, you know, didn't look anything like a person, it would be rubbish. But partly that's because I can't draw a person. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you have to know the science. You have to be able to to understand the the Soviet programming that they did for a couple of decades and understand the manipulation of volume and average intensity 
and all of the different things. And then based on that, you can then start to become a little bit more, you know, free flowing with it all kind of. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful explanation of it. And actually I've had a couple conversations with Chris LaRue on mm. Facebook and I, mm. I was asking him to send me a program. Uh, he's the last few weeks of, of his programming so I could look at it and get an idea of what he does. And he's mm. like, I can't do that. He's like, I literally just come up with it on the day. Well, I think he's now, I think Glenn's programming for him. No, he's not. So you I, know the fifth element? I just had this conversation with him maybe a, two weeks ago. So I, th unless it was... I think it's been about two. Really? I think it's been two weeks and a day, I believe, that Chris has been doing. Or, or Chris is now writing the fifth element. But oh. I definitely think there's some level. I mean, Chris will message one of us because I know he listens. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, if you know... If, yeah, just just let us know. But I think there's some level of collaboration there. I, I saw that Chris... So I think Glenn started programming these these waves in the fifth element and this different style. It, it changed very abruptly from how it was when you and I did it. Yeah. Uh, it just suddenly changed two weeks ago. And then I noticed that the videos that Chris was posting seemed to fit oh. pretty much in line with this. And so I wondered maybe if if... They were saying, you know what, let's work together. Let's program it kind of week to week, but with a certain understanding that things might change mm. during that week based on how I feel coming from Chris. So I wonder if there's some something going on there. Yeah, I didn't even know the fifth element was still a, a like a viable program to run. I yeah, thought it was still there. Of, okay, that's interesting. No, it's still there. Yeah, double day. It's brutal. Yeah, it is brutal, but it's fun. It's, uh... it's a lot of fun. It's very fun, but it's very hard. I mean, my ultimate feelings with this flexible programming is, I think if I, and I, I say this with most programs, is that I think if I run it with you, yeah, uh, we train together, I think it would be the best program I've ever done. Like, I think, I think we know enough about how to train, and we know enough about what our weaknesses, I know what your weaknesses are, you know what mine are, so we could push each other to, other to do the right corrective exercise at the end of the day, do the right sets of 10. Don't always do the things we want to do. Push each other hard on the on the strength work or volume in some way. Be somewhat competitive with it. And then change variation and max out. Are you okay? Yeah, what did my, you just do? My cat almost bit me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you had a cat. Yeah. Come here, buddy. What, oh. what, what's his... Why is, why is your cat attacking you? Because he's violent. Also, I've been, I've been looking at this thing behind you this whole time. Yeah. Over your right shoulder. Um, yes. What is that? Is it? Is that? Is that like a, a, a toy pillow that has an eye and a mouth? That white thing. This. Is that like a seal? No, that. Yeah. That? Is that like a? That's is a that stuffed like a, animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I. Is it like a seal? <laughs> it's just got this funny smiley face and this deathly hollow eye. It's, it's a zebra. <laughs> Oh, I kind of see it now. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> but I also see, I also see something else. It's very weird. Yeah. But well, I appreciate that you tidied up for the podcast today. Well, I switched rooms. Yeah, I know. I've okay. never seen this one before. This has got a lot of pillows in it. It has a lot of pillows. A lot of pillows. I don't know what the hell's going on over there. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, now I'm very much aware that we have spent more time on that question that we probably thought I think we it was would. A great question. Great answer. Uh, great answer. The funny thing was you said we're going to have to come off on a few tangents for the, and you wanted to write them down and I said it will happen. <laughs> and it did. The, the, and I the, think don't you think that naturally my my uh, as personalities you like to be far more structured than I do. I think I think that's true. You like to prepare notes for a lot of things you'd like to know exactly how things are gonna i think it's kind of similar in programming what's really funny is that i like the thought of being structured i like yeah the act of i think it's i think it's the proper thing to do like like in theory proper. for me it's the proper thing to do but i never can carry it out as well as right. i would have hoped and i i think yeah. it's for the better for the most part mm. uh mm -hmm. when i program i'm like okay this this looks perfect it should be just like this, and then I end up doing something different, and it ends up working a little bit better, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not, but it's more fun. Mm -hmm. So, like, we come up with these topics, and we have these tangents, and I much prefer this style of show than like some rigid. I feel like your answer. shows. 
I feel like your podcasting has changed a lot. Yeah. It has changed a lot. Yeah. Like, it... ori- originally, because you started podcasting thinking to yourself, I don't necessarily care about being a good podcaster. Mm. I just want to get out the right questions. I want to get the right answers out from the hosts. Mm. So you'd very carefully plan exactly how you ask what questions and manipulate them to make sure you get the, the, the answer that you're looking for. Mm. And I think that is one style of podcasting that is good. It's it's a good thing to do, but it, it doesn't take into account just the uh, enjoyable factor of sitting down and listening to a conversation. And when a conversation is more free-flowing, you might not get the most direct answer to something, but you also get a more, genu- more genuine conversation. Yeah, but when I was podcasting, and, and still I don't know why people care or, or want to listen to me voice my opinion... You need to not stay stuff like this because one day everyone's going to go, yeah, you know what? You're right. You're right. See you later. He's a fucking (laughs) idiot. Uh, No, but but I would have people come on and and I just never felt like I was in a place to question what they're doing. Right? I'm not going to... When Bob comes on, Bob Takano, I'm not going to say, yeah, Bob, that's your experience. But in my experience, this seems to work better. (laughs) Like, I'm in no place to do that. Mm. So for me, it felt like more structured questions, a little more directed conversation, uh, less, less kind of give and take, more give, give, right. give, uh, to me seemed appropriate. Mm-hmm. But Seb, you always voice your opinion. You're always wrong though. So maybe it's not, <laughs> maybe it's not the best look. I think that's, that's part of it all though, isn't it? Like, this is my understanding of a situation. Yeah. You're saying this, I'm being respectful to assuming that you have thought through your answer really well, but I still disagree. So sure. please, can you... Can you tell me where I might be wrong? Yeah. I, like I think that. that's how it has to be phrased. That's the way it's done. Rather than saying, well, I found this, so how do you explain that then? It's going to be more like, well, I've come to this conclusion, so what was it that led you to yours that I might be lacking? And quick plug to Renaissance Periodization. They have uh, a subscription Jesus, a subscription, <laughs> uh, a, a subscription part of their website. It's called RP+. Plus, and right. they have a lot of great videos and, and, and a forum and a lot of stuff that's very valuable information. Mike Isertal has a series called Arguing to Convince. And I, I pulled a lot mm. from that. I gained a lot of great information. And I think it's been able to help me interact with people that are very charged in what they're saying. Is the idea that you shouldn't argue to convince? The idea is that you you aren't arguing to prove a point. You're no, arguing, you You're arguing or discussing or debating to learn to get closer to the truth right right yeah. so the person that's actually winning is the one that's coming away with the most gained mm-hmm. so i can be completely wrong and you mm-hmm. prove a point but i'm actually the one that's right and, and that i've learned the most mm-hmm. and taken away the most the, the kind of the key points here is that you want to be respectful mm-hmm. you want to ask a lot of questions you want to clarify points uh, you want to be mm-hmm. very detailed and you want to you want to make sure you don't mischaracterize the other person's opinion mm. or, or thoughts. Mm. Uh, so if you say something, I can't say, well, this is your thought, this is your belief, and this is why it's wrong. It's more so like, is this your thought? Is this what you actually believe? Mm-hmm. If these things work out, you think this is going to happen? And then when you say yes, we know, okay, okay, now I know what to go after because we've yeah. already clarified completely what your stance right. is. Right. If right. we right. never discuss your stance, uh, have you heard of a straw manning or like a, yeah, yeah, this, yeah okay so i can set up this straw man uh, this illusion yeah. of what your argument actually is attack mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. and then say okay look i'm right and you're like well you mischaracterize everything i said right uh, right th- it's nothing close to what i even believe no. we're done and, and we both take nothing away from that mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. arguing to convince is really just trying to understand each side uh yeah. clarify find the points of agreement and then find the points of contention and then offer up a solution or mm. uh, opinions or, or 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 evidence that points us in one direction or the other. Mm. There's a um, <clears throat> there's a type of debate, and I can't remember who came up with it. Is it but mass debate? I... Wait. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. Why do you have to drop the tone? We've just been talking about <laughs> Doctor Mike Israel learning more, coming closer to the truth, and then you drop a mass debate joke. <laughs> Um, no, the, the idea was that if you have two people who probably disagree on a topic, you have to each state your point of view, and then the other, then you have to swap it round 
and you have to state what mm. the other person believes to a standard that is satisfactory that the other person agrees that you understand what it is that they're saying. Mm. So you you actually you, you can't yeah you can't misrepresent them in any way. I have to be able to say back to you what your point is to a standard that you're going to say, yeah, that is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. And by doing that, it allows you to gain some level of better understanding, mutual respect. And, you know, in that you can't be jabbing the other person with anything because they're going to say, nope, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm saying. And you can't move on until you've done it. So it does give you a certain level of um, respect, I suppose. Yeah. During it. And, and, and then you go and drop a masturbate joke <laughs> and, and you wonder why. So can I just ask you another question quickly? Yes. Can you explain to me how on earth you're 26 years old? I was born. Because this is this is news to yeah, me. I was born in 1992. You were 92. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I can see how that could work out with the maths. Yeah, I appreciate that. But no, what I mean is like, I thought that you were younger because. So what happened? How did? What do you mean? How old this were is, you? This is not. I, I don't no, think this is a well-formed question. By how old were you when you started your degree? I was a little later in life. So we, we, yeah. we've never formally done like a, a, a background podcast where we kind of no, I have ourselves. no idea and I who have, you are I have where a wild, you come from. I have a wild background. Um, <laughs> like, like very crazy. Uh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> like, we'll have to do that. It's, it's funny because ours are actually similar in that we both dropped out of college. Several. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then somehow. I went through three through. universities. Yeah. Yeah. So dropped out of two and finally stuck. I, I was saying this to someone today. I went to a third one and I made my way through it is the way I would describe it. Like I just decided <laughs> I'm going to do this one. And then as soon as I finished, I started up weightlifting house. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. But yeah, we should do that at some point. We're we going to have like 10 questions where we ask like, what the fuck happened to you <laughs> yeah. how are you the way that you are well i'll tell you what <laughs> let's do that on the morning brew and make that an exclusive yeah we should do, you do not that like but... that is that not a... you No, i do like, like that i, just, I don't and... like the... no 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 i sighed because it's like <sighs> i don't want to keep having to make people move over and listen to the morning brew but at the same time i don't feel like that's enough weightlifting sus sustenance to yeah. put on out to the regular podcast so actually, Patreon probably is the place to go for uh, us to put that. So I think that's probably the safest place we're going to get the least amount of backlash of why did we just listen to an hour of Josh dropping out of university? <laughs> talking about drug use and uh, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. oh okay. This is going to go places. Yeah, this is going to go places. But Oh, we've had the same. <laughs> okay, enough said. Yeah and, and, yeah, and you say that, but we've been going on for about an hour and 17 minutes about programming, so... I think I think there's a good. Were you a uh, were you a trend addict? I've never touched <laughs> performance enhancing drugs one day in my life. Um, I would take steroids. I would, but what does that mean? You would, like at some point, I'll consider it when I'm right, not okay. competing in in weightlifting. Yeah. Did because... you see when uh, there's this definite point where you notice it? I don't know if you watch Joe Rogan podcast, but I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this point where you notice at like, I can't remember what episode it is, like maybe episode 800, he starts changing physically and it's like, this is when he went on TRT. Yeah. And now he, I've heard him now say in episodes, yeah, you know, I, I'm on TRT. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting and you see it like, Jesus, this dude just got swole. Yeah. Um, well, it's no way it's the kettlebell training doing that. On it. That's O-N-N-I-T. Yeah, take your mushroom powder. <laughs> it's a nootropic too. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. It definitely works like that. Um, Makes you smart. Uh, I feel like I had something to say, and then we. Uh, well, we were let's just about, touch. So we, we can touch quickly on a few of the others, maybe. Yeah, I just. Oh, okay. So the last thing with uh, arguing to convince, it's ah, it's yeah. it's a difficult uh, conversation to have in that it's time intensive, right? Right. There are different levels of uh, commitment that you have to express. One is like, okay, I get one post to make a point. So it's going to look a lot different from mm -hmm. we're actually having a conversation face-to-face -face on the phone um, in a thread right. where we repeatedly yeah. submit our opinions and get yeah. a response. And it takes a little acknowledgement on the person's part because there's the process of like clarifying terms, uh, right. making sure you're on the same page or, or examining the landscape of the discussion. Mm -hmm. 
and while that sounds maybe overwhelming for people who are looking to make a point, um, I think it just makes for more productive conversations at the it does. at the end of the day. I tell you what I would love to do. I think I've mentioned this before, but I think it would be like the best version of the podcast possible is to bring on two coaches yeah. with differing opinions and mediate the conversation. I tried to do and that. Who with? John North and Greg Everett. I told you we should get them on and talk about the elbows back. It's not going to work. <laughs> See? No, no, because it's not going to work. Because yeah. because Greg has thought very deeply about the yeah. whole elbows up versus back. And John is an exceptional athlete who pulled his elbows back and did very well from it. Mm. And and that's what he believes. And mm. I don't think there's going to be... I don't think there's any way that you can mediate that without it becoming emotional. Yeah. It's just not possible. But I, but I would love to... I'm trying to think of people who would be a good... I mean, someone like... Um, so someone like Dan Bell like and Sean, Sean Waxman. Waxman. Yeah. yeah, those two. About should you finish up on the balls of your feet? Where yeah, should the weight? I, I, th- you know, I, that I don't want to mischaracterize Dan's stance, though. I feel like he said that, and, and it could be wrong. I know what he said. Listen to this, but he said it, it happens naturally. Yes, but but he said that it happens naturally in the sense that when you jump, your heels naturally come off. But he said that when you do a high pull, your heels should then land quickly after. See, because you're not actually your 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 balance shouldn't actually be far enough forward that you can pause up on the toes. And you said that, so you shouldn't be able to pause up on the toes for more than a second or whatever. Whereas Sean, from my understanding, would say that in a high pull it should be so so straight that you can basically pause on the toe and you could drop the bar at the peak height and stop and just stay up on your on your tiptoes yeah. and then come back down. Whereas Dan believes that the weight should be further back and if you're able to do that, you just are too far forward. Mm. And there's so much merit to what they're both saying that that's the kind of conversation that I would love to mediate. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be very cool. I wouldn't invite you on, by the way. Well, considering <laughs> the fact that I'm a co-host and I'm on almost every episode, I think the people would demand it. So I don't know about that. Might get a bit too hectic having just, all of us. Just on. everyone send in hate mail and tell them that, or tell tell them, tell Seb that you want me on the show, please. I <laughs> please need you let guys. me be on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there are a few people who would be good to have on. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think, is there anyone who is very, that you know of who's very anti-deadlifting? Because obviously having Glenn on would be good. Yeah, you know, I don't think... Although Glenn would just go, you know you know how savage, Oh like, yeah. when you did a bad intro and he would like <laughs> ripped you apart. He like, just, he, if he, he starts doing that to a well-known coach, I'm going to be I'm be like, God damn it, Glenn. Could it's you funny, because just... <laughs> he starts getting loud and then yeah. just starts talking over you and it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> It's really funny. Like I can't wait to get Glenn back on, but uh Yeah. Well I just edited the podcast with him and oh, I still fire haven't uploaded podcast. it. Fire podcast. Huh? It was a fire oh, podcast. Fire. Yeah. It was good. It was good. The, the only awkward thing oh it doesn't matter. I was gonna say the awkward thing was in ed- something in editing, but that's just so boring for people listening that they don't need to know about the editing process. They so don't. don't worry about that. Right. Um Josh, there are a few other topics. Uh, we can't go into them in full depth. I wonder if we should skim a couple of them. Uh, the one to do is Thailand. Oh yeah. I don't know how how clued up you are on on any of this stuff. Um, I just know that sent... the six lifters um, were popped, and right. that's about the extent of it. Right. So a, a bunch of a bunch of weightlifters from Thailand were were popped. Loads of them were recent uh, world championships from world champions from. Uh, Ashgabat 2018, all tested positive, and then of course it's meant to be the World Championships are in Thailand this year. Um, so I think that's where the the question comes down to is where where are the World Championships going to be this year? Um, I don't know what you think. Do, do you have I've, any? I mean, I, I know that you wrote on the on the on the question. This one's for Seb, mm-hmm. but no, I, I I can't give a an even. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. An opinion that's relatively close to what's going to happen. Right. I'm trying to think who I had this conversation with and whether it was on the podcast or not with someone. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any inside information that other people might have. Uh, it seems to me like it would make sense, seeing as they still have a reasonable amount of time that they might move the World Championships. They did it in 2017 to Anaheim. 
And that meant that the USA had it two years out of three. Obviously, it was in Rio in 2016, but they had it in Houston 15 and uh, uh, Anaheim 17. And because USA is the fastest growing culture or has the fastest growing fan base of weightlifting and a huge amount of money that the sort of surround support actually comes from the USA in a sense that in the USA, the sport is a sport for fans rather than just a sport for the athletes and the and the government. Um, and the fact that the USA can get ready so fast. Uh, who was I speaking about this with? Was it Dan Bell? Is he who said it? But the, I, I mean, the idea that because USAW uh, isn't government run, mm. they they can go through with this sort of stuff a lot quicker. Um, I spoke with this about this, and I, I, I'm stealing what this person said, almost word for word. I'm trying to think who it was. I have so many conversations now on podcasts. I can't remember if it was real life or podcast life. Mm. Um, but anyway, I mean, if uh, if it might have been, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if if they wanted to move the world championships to Russia, uh, the Russian Weightlifting Federation will have to go through the government, ask for funding ask for all of these different things. They're going to have to go through loads of bureaucracy, loads of paperwork before they can get it. Because everything is private in the USA and USAW is privately owned, essentially it's not a government run, um, uh, I don't think at least. There's a lot of you know um, private money in it. I think they are able to go through with things, go through with decisions and raise money a lot faster than another country would be able to do. Are, are you looking it up now just to check? No. Oh, you lent in as though you were going to do something. Well, because the funny. lighting's way different back here. <laughs> so you're just watching yourself in the top corner to see, <laughs> find I'm, your best I'm, angle. I'm listening. I'm, I'm yeah. intently listening. I wish you'd yeah. make your point. Well, well, I think my point is pretty clear. Is that, <laughs> um, I think there's a chance. There's a good chance that they'll move. Mm. You know, I think the IWF is doing everything they can to stay in Paris 2024. And it's looking better, even though they've got all these drug tests, all these all these pops. Um, and so I think to appease the IOC, it might be possible that they end up mm. saying, we're not going to be there as further punishment to that country. Where else can we go? A lot of money through fans in the USA. They can get things done quickly because USAW is private and it's not a government. You know, Phil Andrews is not an employee of the government. Mm. He's an employee of USAW. So they can get things done quicker. They did it already in 2017, so I think there's a good chance that, that there's a chance that maybe it's going to move over to the USA. Yeah. Do you think if if you were had to if you were to have to assign a percentage to the likelihood of weightlifting being pulled from the Olympics, what would you give it? Like 60% chance, 50% chance? Do you think it's, it's going to be it's, pulled? Yeah. Do you think it's a real? There's a, like a possibility because of the drug tests. Uh, There's a possibility that it will be pulled. Yeah. I mean, what would you? But it's I assign I, it? I I think it's very slim personally. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like I think it's like you know five percent chance it's getting pulled. I th I think I think we are doing what the IOC wants us to do. We are evidently cracking down. I mean, just the fact that you look at some of the top countries that got all the busts they are shadows of their former selves. Mm. So if something has worked, you know, the, there was the, um, the EGAT Cup uh, this last weekend and uh, a, a bunch of lifters lifted who were previous very high-level athletes, one of them, Apti Alkadov. Apti went like 152, 187, I think. What body weight? I mean, as a... Was he in... 81 or an 89... But either way, I mean, he's done 210, done 211. I think wow. he's even done 213 as an 85. So he's, you know, some 30 kilos down almost in terms of his clean and jerk. His snatch is over 20 kilos down from his best. Um, most of these lifters from those countries who suffered a lot of the, a lot of the pops are, are so far down below what they previously were at that, you know, I, I, I think there are real changes being made. And I think just by the nature of the sport growing, that's another thing that's going to lend itself to the IOC because the IOC wants eyes. Mm. You know, with CrossFit growing, weightlift grows, and a lot of the CrossFitters are going to want to, want to watch weightlifting in the Olympics. So I think if we do what they say and we clean up a bit, 
we'll be in. And I, and I think we're doing that. And I think we have evidence that we're doing that because every week it's like another nation goes down. Yeah. Interesting. That's how I feel. Yeah, That's was, I, feel. I mean, it's going to be crazy if we're pulled. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. It's going to be crazy. I feel like man. people talk about it so casually as if it's something that's destined it's to happen. It's not casual. Oh, I don't think it's destined to happen, but it's... I mean, it, if it goes down, you won't see any Chinese weightlifters anymore. You won't see Russian weightlifters. You won't see Iranian weightlifters. Like, they're not going to compete. Why would they compete? Yeah. They do only you, get government funding so they can win medals at the Olympics. What do you think? No one cares about US? anything else. It will remain in the US as a as a as like a hobby, a pastime. I think I think probably they'll become weightlifting leagues, yeah. that kind of stuff. It'll become kind of interesting. It might become a little bit more I guess free markety, like you'll get a bunch of people being like, I'm gonna create the new federation. Um yeah. but but the 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 seriousness of it, the I'm going to train to become an Olympic champion is over. So the funding for all of the top countries around the world drops. So they no longer bother competing because it's not a sport to them anymore. Um, you know, the USA is kind of different in that sense. Like you guys love American football, but it's not in the Olympics. No one in the rest of the world cares or knows what it means, really, American football. But in America, it's a big deal. Mm. So you guys have this this culture where you can play sports that are meaningless to the rest of the world. I mean, you're still amazing at other sports. Like the USA wins the Olympics basically every year and China comes in second. Or maybe it's sometimes the other way around. But, you know, you two are the top every time. So you're clearly very good at the other sports. But you have sports in your country that no one else does that you're very happy to continue to do at the highest level possible. You know what's interesting, But you don't get too, that elsewhere, really. Is that the, like the NBA, uh, I don't know right. what they call the championships, like world championships, whatever it is. Yeah, they call it the world. They they say that this is when the team wins. They call them the best team in the world. Yeah, but that's almost more respectable uh, or, or or more appreciated than an Olympic medal in the U.S. Like yeah, it is, this yeah. team is the best in the NBA, and then the they collect the players. They go win gold medals, and no one really cares that no much, cares. which is right, crazy. Right. Yeah, yeah, I know it's, it's a strange thing, but USA is a interesting <laughs> country. Hey, Do you walk, enjoy that bit of mouth, banter? That, yeah, that banter that Michael and I were having about the USA. Michael the UK. is a stereotypical, <laughs> the people's fan, as we call him. The people's American. Yeah, the people's American. I love he is that. very American. <laughs> yeah, he uh, definitely is American. So, what's the last? I'm sorry to interrupt you with the podcast, Seb. Take, sorry, no, I'm, I'm getting called. Call. I'm getting calls. I'm just muting it. Jesus. <laughs> so, um, so let's answer this last question and then wrap up the show. Yeah, I really have to wrap up the show. Are you going to read the last question? or? Okay. All right. I thought you were going to. I don't have it. All right. Um, <laughs> so the question was about minimal training and muscle mass. Mm. Let me grab the actual question. I want to make sure I get it word for word. Um, so the question was how to gain weight brackets muscle. So how to gain muscle on low frequency slash time constraints. Basically not possible, question mark. Uh, and you said, good question. We'll tackle this on the X episode of The Morning <laughs> Brew, which we're not doing. I'm apparently We're tackling it on the main podcast. Yeah. You are a liar. Um, but, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Because I think I read that and go, no, it's not impossible. It's not optimal, but it's not impossible. As, as with every question we get... There are more questions than answers upon initial reading, because I just think can people just for all of you Patreon followers out there, when you ask a question, clarify the shit like, out of I, it. I need to know your blood type, right? Uh, what you ate for dinner last <laughs> night. Like this is all useful information. Your marital status. <laughs> that's very useful as well. Uh, yeah. No, but the, my question: How many times per week and for how long? That's the question. Well, that's the that's the that's question. All I need to it's know. How many times yeah. do you actually show up to the gym on a in a weekly basis? On a weekly yeah. basis, because if you're there three times a week, you can have a three time frequency or three x frequency. Right. You can squat, you can press, you can deadlift, and you can pull. If you're doing the Olympic lifts, oh god, that sounds hideous. If you're doing the lifts, the the competition <laughs> lifts. Uh, you lifting. can you can still squat and pull and press. It's going to take a little more time, right? So you talked about needing to have shorter workouts. So maybe mm -hmm. you pick a snatch, a squat, and a snatch grip push press, or maybe you pick a clean, 
uh, a front squat and then uh, a strict press and then right. maybe pick a jerk or or, or, or both lifts yeah you, you can have any combination uh, you can do lifts more frequently um, I, I mean I, I really don't even know how to answer this to be honest I mean because... I mean let's put it like this is that before we had a rich literature of sport training people trained once a week and then maybe it went up to twice and then went up to three times and now it's at 15 times a week or more like did you see that video of Re- Rebecca Koha that came out oh, the other yeah. day she's training like three times a day um, but people got you know, people snatched and clean and jerked people clean and jerked over 200 kilos training three times a week like it happens it's not it's not as ideal you know the more the, the greater the frequency generally the better anyway and like you were saying before we started recording, if you can just split those three days a week into uh, into just two sessions at a time, yeah. So it's still three days a week, but it's morning evening. That will improve it. But but yeah, I mean, it, the, people get at least in powerlifting they get very strong and very jacked off training with a lower frequency three times a week, as long as you do the things that are important to you. So if you've got good technique, it's a lot easier to get through this sort of programming. You know, you can do, um, you know, three, four sets of squats a day, three times a week, and that's pretty good. Or week one, have three sets. By week four, have five sets a time. You've periodized it to some extent, and then you wave back down and change things up a bit. But you can definitely, in my opinion, get gain muscle mass, especially if you're consuming mm-hmm. a lot of calories. Like, this is doable. This isn't the end of the world. This is definitely possible. Well, my question would be, how much do you feel like you need to do? Because you can go in and do one set of an exercise, and obviously there's some thought out there that you need a certain amount of uh, disruption to the muscle to really maximally mm-hmm. stimulate muscle growth. But mm-hmm. if you went in and did one set of 10 on every exercise, you went in the next day, did one set of 10 on every exercise, mm-hmm. and then the third day... Mm-hmm and then did one set of 10, maybe with a higher frequency, the same volume you'd be getting in one day, that might help uh, stimulate mm-hmm. the muscle a bit more. It really right. depends on your time constraints. It depends on the amount of days you're going to be in the gym. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're asking this question, I'm assuming you're not incredibly muscular. So a wide array of uh, approaches would probably work. Right. If you were more advanced, you would already have something figured out. Yeah. Um, and then you would need a more detailed plan. But for now, just try and train every muscle twice a week and yeah. fit them around the competition lifts. Yeah. yeah get, get a coach. coach. They'll well, work it out. Yeah. What? Well, then you wouldn't need the the Patreon. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But he, I don't think he necessarily follows the programming. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he follows the weightlifting, the weightlifting house program. But, but yeah, I mean... Get someone who knows what they're talking about, who can write it up, because you can fit enough volume uh, into into the the right exercises to get pretty strong and jacked off three days a week. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, just look at um, look at Pendley Strong Three. Yeah, it's got like thirty athletes on it, and they train three days a week. I think the problem with an approach like that is that the days become so long. I, I'll be I, okay. Yeah, that's true. Glenn's days on that program is just. <laughs> so much savagery it's, it's like it's like a good three hour session but, to try I mean, get through but it's that. really challenging because i have a, a couple people that do three days a week and it's uh-huh. so difficult to snatch to clean to jerk to do a squat to do to right. try and do some sort of accessory movements uh that you find those workouts are two two and a half hours yeah if you're not really cognizant of the time constraint yeah so i mean something has to give there's never a perfect plan, but you mm-hmm. can at least give your best shot and make some gains. Right. right, right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's doable. I mean, just eat well, eat a lot of protein, yeah. eat a good num- number of calories, and don't just do snatches and clean and jerks yeah. and pulls. Make sure you're doing back squats and you're doing pull-ups and rows and some push press and make sure you're doing things that are going to break you. I mean, if, if you're sacrificing frequency then you have to increase time under tension in some way yeah. so you have to add those kinds of exercises where you're you're eccentrically and concentrically loading rather than just a snatch or a jerk well you made a really good point there 
if you're looking to maximize muscle hypertrophy, maybe when you snatch, do some overhead squats, some snatch grip push presses um, as a part of a complex. Right. When you do your pulls, follow the bar down. Like yeah, try and max- maximize the movement. Um, right. A quick question for you. I just programmed in for the first time slow concentric snatch grip deadlifts. Mm. And I, I was kind of nervous to do that. Not easy. Yeah. Well, I'm really nervous because I think it's like you always think an exercise is going to do really well. Mm. And then when you're slapped in the face with the reality that it's a shitty decision, uh, it's a tough pill to swallow. I've never done it. I think it's I, I program them in for deadlifts for my power lifters. Actually, that's not true. I have to, I've done it for snatching like yeah. a one rep max, but a slow pull slow pull. So I thought about that, but for deadlift to take out the complexity of the movement, but to still right. focus on balance in the pull. Uh-huh. What do you, what do you think? I think it's a great idea for balance. I'd almost never considered it as that. I mean, that's that's the reason why I love pausing during the pull, is to yeah. improve your positioning and make sure you've got the this the combined center of mass of you and the bar in the right part of your foot. I think people, and so doing that for a while and then yeah. maybe moving into slowing it and then doing the full one weeks months later. I think like that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, was that your rationale? Yeah, my rationale was that just slowing it down is. I guess people just get caught up in, in the idea that every snatch has to be fast from the floor to the hip. Even when you mm. pause, you're trying to accelerate to the pause, past the pause. Um, mm. And you just have to intentionally say, slow the F down, four seconds up. Uh, mm-hmm. Really focus on keeping your feet flat. And I guess this is my, this is kind of like an experiment. This is a, this is a case study we can use for future programming. Um, mm-hmm. But in theory, it should work. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like it a lot. Sweet. I think it's going to work well. All right, Josh, I think we should wrap that one up. Let me just check on my recorder. We are, oh, it's been a long one. Hour 40. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think it's been a fun episode. We will, uh, we're going to have Max on in a couple of days, so that will be up uh, a few days after you guys hear this one. Uh, who else have we got? Probably going to have Ed Edward Baker, Baker on at some point food soon. Food weightlifting, coffee food weightlifting. Right, uh, we've got a bunch of good, good, good athletes lined up. You know, he's strong um, jerks. Yeah, yeah, I know. He's we got should ask shoulders. him why he does that. He's got strong shoulders. Yeah, yeah, he's got Doesn't strong he? legs yeah. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a weak low um, back apparently, but that's mm, beyond the beyond this discussion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that we have asked people who follow us on Patreon, and I'd love to extend the offer out to everyone listening, if if you made it so far through the episode, is that <laughs> Josh and I are hoping for a bit more. Well. We want to use this opportunity to get a bit of feedback from you guys about about what we're doing. You know, just by the very nature of podcasting, you're speaking to, in many ways, no one at the time of speaking, other than seeing Josh's head on a very small screen in front of me. <laughs> uh, I have no real feedback, uh, and nor does Josh about a lot of these things. And the the messages we get from people saying, "Love the show," it's uh, that's absolutely awesome, and I appreciate it. But what I'd love to get actually is a bit of constructive criticism to some extent. Are there types of shows that you love the most do you love it when it's just me and josh do you hate it when it's just me and josh do you want more coaches do you want more athletes um that kind of thing do you want us to you know when we did the episode on nutrition we did one on hypertrophy do you want us to stick to these basic principles and try and nail them out uh just a bit of feedback would be great so you know drop us uh, messages on dm us on instagram or uh, email us you can email me at contact at weightliftinghouse.com you can email josh at is it what, what's yours josh is it josh at philosophical weightlifting no, or philosophical, philosophical weightlifting, weightlifting at, gmail. at gmail.com and, and at can gmail. i just com. uh can i just say something really quickly please i would love for all of the people who are considering reaching out to us to think about what you're saying um i understand that you can listen to a show and and i've read this on itunes so the reviews are for everyone to read but Seb says, um, a lot and interrupts the guest. And like, I get that, but that's something that it's, it's really difficult to change in in the middle of a conversation. I'm not going to think about what I'm, what noises I'm making, uh, how we're interacting. Like, (laughs) I didn't even know that that was a, yeah. Someone's like, Oh, he interrupts every guest. He says, yeah, a lot, (laughs) you know, shit like that. But I just want it to be a well thought out. Like, you know, it would really make more sense for you guys to, x y and z because x y and z right. versus like you know seb's really ugly can he change that and the, the answer is no he can't change that <laughs> he's stuck with that mug for life i am 
Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. I, it's funny that that whole. I'm I'm aware that because when I edit the podcast, you know, I can see all of the tracks. I can see you, me, and and the guest. And when they're talking, you're silent, and I have all of these lines where I'm going, mm, yeah. <laughs> but the issue is, like, that's just, and I, I've actually considered maybe I need to get really good at every time I stop talking, I go and I mute the microphone or something. But it's just how I talk. Mm. Like, and I've always done it when I'm speaking with people, I try to be engaged. And so I agree to things that they're saying during. And I find it hard to just go silent and not say a thing. Um, I'd rather you honestly do that than seem disinterested because you're just so quiet and, right. and laid back like at least for the conversation it helps mm. make it a little more interactive and meaningful to where you're yeah. listening you're responding um mm. and then when i quiet down you can continue on with whatever <laughs> you're about to say right so yeah yeah so anyway that's that's kind of the, the 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 thing that we're putting out there is if you guys have any suggestions of directions you want us to go uh things that we're doing well that you think we could even do better on or things that we're dropping the ball on please do let us know because it it gives us some level of direction otherwise you know we're shooting and we're hoping that people enjoy it but we we don't necessarily know it's one of the one of the things that you often get as as anyone who puts anything out online uh with instagram you have a comment section with the podcast you just kind of don't so we'd love a bit of feedback uh josh let's wrap that one up there uh, I think that's a good place to do it. Of course, you can follow Josh on Instagram at Josh Phil Josh underscore <laughs> Josh underscore Phil W L. That's P H I L W L. Uh, or on Facebook because Josh does post a lot of fire articles on there. I've been enjoying those recently. Oh, thank Posted you. a good one about the comment section of a Mike to share video, which I found interesting. Uh, I read that today. Mm. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram, Seb Ostrovich. Uh, or at weightlifting underscore house email us get in touch with us we appreciate all the comments and of course head over to weightlifthouse.com grab some t-shirts grab some hoodies grab some barbells head over to patreon get programming for one dollar a month the morning brew uh safanoff interviews bodhi santavi interviews greg faris interviews <laughs> you're nodding at me i'm so pleased i got it right uh and a bunch of other cool stuff we do really appreciate it thank you once again of course for tuning in and we shall catch you all on another episode of the Weightlifting House podcast.